the last presenter of the morning uh, is Mark Elliott. Mark is the Devon Beaver Project Lead at the Devon Wildlife Trust. And he's going to talk to us about reintroduction of Eurasian beavers into England. And I have to say, I had a wonderful afternoon in the autumn with Mark and colleagues looking at one of the beaver release sites in Devon. And it just blew me away. It was wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Hopefully you can hear me and you can all see my yes, screen. We can hear you and we can see your screen, Mark. Thank you. Brilliant. OK, um, so I'm going to talk for 10 minutes uh, about the reintroduction of Eurasian beavers into England. Obviously, it's quite a big subject um, and uh, there is a longer version of this talk that's available online. So um, if you do want to hear more afterwards, then um, there's a link at the uh, on the last slide. Um, so I've been working with the two um, beaver projects that Devon Wildlife Trust has been involved with, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both of them today um, and then talk a, a bit about the wider context and what's happening elsewhere um, across the country. But just a, a quick introduction first to the species, because many people are not familiar with it yet. Um, it's a, a large animal, much larger than many people imagine, um, around a metre long, sometimes considerably more. Uh, and uh, 18 kilograms in weight is an average and some of the animals we're now dealing with are 25 to 30 kilograms so they they're really quite a significant animal um, native to this country hunted to extinction around 400 years ago probably more than that um, in some parts of the country um, we call them a keystone species because they really do have a profound engineering effect on their environment and that obviously um, has knock-on impacts on a huge range of other species. Entirely herbivorous, uh, in the summer months they're feeding on soft riverside plants, um, and in the winter it's more of the woody stuff, so they're, they're coppicing willow particularly, poplars, other hardwoods, and feeding on the bark and the, um, and the smaller branches and twigs. They're a very territorial animal, they live in family groups, and that family group will defend a territory. Um, and it's that territorial behavior that controls numbers. So they, once they reach carrying capacity or approach carrying capacity within an area, then dispersing two-year-olds are often subject to attacks from um, territory holders and uh, the injuries can be pretty nasty and often go septic. Um, they have one litter of kits a year, uh, usually born in May, an average of three kits in a litter. So they're not particularly fast breeders. Um, some of the animals that we've had down here have had five kits in a litter, which is really encouraging, um, shows they're really thriving. Um, they're mostly nocturnal though, so we don't see them very much except in the summer evenings sometimes, and they are semi-aquatic. This is a really important part of their ecology. They are very much they are they're reliant on water courses. They need the safety of deep water, uh, and that's that's a very important part of um, of what they do. And uh, they're living in burrows and lodges. Um, so in the River Otter, for example, they're living in burrows in the riverbank, and further upstream where they're building wetlands, then they'll they'll construct a lodge, which is a big pile of sticks and and mud. And then finally, and I'll come on to more of it later, they build dams in order to create ponds. So if they find themselves in an area without deep water, then they can construct a dam in order to, to build a pond so they've got that safety of water. So that's a very quick run through of the species. And um, you're probably many of you are aware that the government made a decision in August that the river otter beavers uh, that are living wild on the river otter would be allowed to remain in perpetuity. And that is essentially a decision that the first reintroduction of a, of a native mammal back into the uh, in English landscape. So it's a very significant um, decision, very important milestone. And a lot of the, um, the data that supports that decision, um, I will talk about today in this, in this talk. But essentially it showed that the River Otter Beaver Trial had been a success. And so this trial was the first licensed release of beavers into the wild in England, um, covered the entire River Otter catchment. So the beavers were permitted to move anywhere within the 250 kilometres squared of the catchment, but they weren't permitted to, to leave and go into any adjacent catchments. Uh, and there was a, a science and evidence forum which was responsible for collating the data and overseeing the research and that was chaired by Professor Richard Brazier at the University of Exeter. And 
him and a team of us uh, compiled this science and evidence report, which is available online. It's on the University of Exeter website, and it's about 130 odd pages. Uh, we've also got hard copies if people do want them. Um, but there's a huge amount of information there about the work that's been carried out over the course of the of the five years. And I will try and pull out some of the key points um, that are relevant to this audience here. So the first thing really is about survey work. And um, obviously, uh, beavers are pretty big and uh, easy to spot if they're out and about in um, in the evenings. And so we do get quite a lot of records of sightings of beavers, particularly in those areas where they're known to be. Um, and because they're wearing ear tags, or the animals in, in the trial were wearing ear tags, it did allow us to actually um, monitor the actions of individual beavers, which was really helpful. But as with most mammal monitoring, the most useful way of, of seeing what they're doing is mapping of field signs. And so we did an annual winter survey of um, feeding signs, looking for where they've been feeding, particularly on riverside hardwoods like willow. And you can see here, this is Hugh using a trimble to map uh, a bit of coppiced willow here. So this is exactly the sort of thing that we see a huge amount of in those parts of a river where, where beavers are active. And that's really obvious, um, particularly during the, the period between January and March. So that's the time really when we carry out this survey work. And that allows us to produce heat maps, which show where in the catchment the beavers are most active. And that can give us a rough idea of where the territories are. So at the beginning of our trial back in 2015, we had two family groups living mostly in the lower part of the river catchment. So for anybody that knows the River Otter, um, the very top is Otterhead Lake. So you're actually just into Somerset here. Um, you've then got the main A30 crossing the catchment here. Honiton is somewhere here. And then where the beavers were originally discovered was around Ottery St. Mary, which is just here. And then the deeper water continues down to the mouth at Budley Salterton and Otterton. And so these two areas of deeper water are where the beavers first went to. And that's again, it's back to that ecology of the animals needing the, the deeper water. But by the end of the trial, we had around 13 areas of activity. Uh, and within those 13 areas, we knew of seven breeding pairs. And there were probably other young breeding pairs establishing as well within those 13 areas. But you can see they've they've moved right up to Otterhead. So it's about 50 kilometers between here and, and the bottom of the river. So it's a, a long journey for a beaver. But as I say, they're a big animal and they're very mobile. And you can see they've also used this um, this tributary here, which is the River Tail. And they've left the main river and set themselves up a little territory in here. And this this is the map from 2019, uh, the March 2019 survey. And clearly we've had another winter survey since then, and we're just about to undertake the next winter survey. So we're anticipating, and we know in fact, that we've got more activity in some of these other tributaries now as well. So they really are colonizing the catchment very well. Um, the catchment's very, very suitable for them, um, and the beavers are clearly thriving. Now I talked about beavers building dams, and it's probably the most famous part of what they do. Um, and they build dams to create deep water where it's not uh, not present. Um, but dams are very variable. They're very dynamic structures in fast flowing streams where you've got a lot of energy in the water course. The dams reflect that. They're very, um, very dynamic structures. They come and go all the time. Um, in lower energy systems, particularly the sort of ditch networks, then the dams are much more stable because the, the amount of energy in the water is lower, um, the beavers are able to get a, a more of a stable structure in place, and that tends to be fairly permanent. Um, but what we've um, what we've done towards the end of the trial is to do a snapshot survey of all of the dams within the catchment at that particular time in October 2019, and we mapped 28 dams in six of the territories at that point. So that just gives you an idea of the extent of of the damming that we were seeing. The University of Exeter have also produced this dam capacity model, which is a really useful part of the of the trial. And it shows where in the catchment, based on the physical geography of the watercourses, beavers could build dams successfully. And it shows, as we've found very much in reality, that you just don't get dams built in the main stem of the watercourse. 
But where they are building dams is in these tributaries, in the smaller headwater streams, um, right up in these top areas. So I don't know how easy it is to see this map, but it's the blue and the green areas that are the areas where we would expect the most dams to be built. And they're where the dams tend to be a bit more stable. Where you've got um, dams that are, are, are occasional or rare, so particularly in this stretch here, this is where we see dams being washed out all the time. So they're obviously at the limit of their viability. So they're, they're much less stable structures. Couple of OK, thanks, John. Um, and the it is the sort of dynamism, it's the movement of these dams that generates a lot of the habitats. And so this is a before and after picture. So you've actually got a beaver dam here in place after it's washed out and after a period of time. And in fact, you can see the same stump here on the on the picture. You can see this lovely fresh spawning gravel that's been created as a result. And so it's they're breathing life into the watercourse. And we've done a lot of fisheries research on the back of this, and I'm not going to talk about the data uh, here because I really haven't got the time. But what it does show is that it's these new spawning gravels that are being created by this dynamism that's providing the habitats for trout to spawn, species like bullheads. And then in the pools um, where you've got standing water and more sediment, then that's where the lamprey and other species are. And ecologically, we know that the beavers are having a profound impact on some of our sites as well. So the coppicing of willow is opening out the scrub. And this is a county wildlife site that's been mapped by the university. And the red areas show where the beavers are pushing back the scrub from the, um, from the grassland site. So again, it's improving the condition of that site. Uh, other species increasing dramatically. So frog spawn up from 10 clumps to 681 clumps on one site. Um, huge increase because of the amount of new habitats available. But they do create conflicts and there's no two ways about that. We've seen five sites where we've had land drainage impacts uh, on agricultural land. They feed on maize. So where you've got maize very close to watercourses, they love that. And they do also feed on riverside orchards. And so management interventions and good quality advice are critical in terms of bringing beavers back. And a lot of that is about education and myth busting. There's a huge amount of misinformation and myths around beavers, and it's correcting those, getting that general level of awareness up is a really important part of bringing them back into new catchments. OK, just a last slide, really. Um, this is just to show where we've got uh, beaver projects happening around the country. So although we've got wild beavers living on the River Otter, we've also got them on the Tamar. We know of beavers living in Somerset. We've got a good population of wild beavers in Kent. There are beavers also in Wales as well, uh, living wild. And then there's a rash of new enclosed projects um, springing up around the country with beavers coming down from the conflict sites in Scotland at the moment. In fact, we brought another one down last night down to, to Plymouth. Um, there's been other projects in, uh, in, in Exmoor and elsewhere that are, are getting their beavers at the moment. So it's, um, there's a lot happening in the beaver world. And just a quick thank you to all of the organisations that funded us during the course of the trial. Um, we didn't receive any government funding um, for the trial itself. So we were reliant on a, a range of, of charitable trusts and others um, to uh, support us. And um, as I say, um, there is a there is a link there to the, the full talk, which you can see on the Green Minds um, Plymouth website, if anybody wants to see it again. OK, thanks very much. Right, let's see if I can come out of that. Thank you, Mark. That was, that was just great. Uh, wonderful news. Uh, so questions to Mark. Joel? Yeah, we've got a, a few questions that have come through. Um, first, Emma Knowles would like to know, how did you stop the beavers leaving the catchment? Well, um, we only had one case of a beaver that left the catchment. Um, and essentially, it's to do with the carrying capacity. So they really only leave that water if they are being pushed out by other beavers. So where you've got territorial conflicts happening, that tends to be the main driver of dispersal. Um, and so if you've got a, a good sized catchment like we were working with, with a relatively low population of beavers, the animals are just not needing to disperse. Uh, and so we feel we felt and it was shown that the um, the catchment boundary, the higher ground was was quite an effective barrier to dispersal. Okay, great, thanks. Um, another question from Justin D. Uh, has the trial provided any insight into how beaver populations affect other UK riverine 
mammals and bird life? Yeah, I mean, in my longer version of the talk, I talk about this in quite a lot more detail because obviously there's key species like the, river, the otters living on the river otter. Um, and we've had quite a lot of evidence of interaction between those species, um, mostly positive, really. Um, we do think that otters may predate young beaver kits if they get a chance. But we do also find that otters are using beaver burrows as halt sites. Um, we've had an increase in water voles on one site as a result of the uh, the increased amount of standing water and the, the edge habitat that's been created and the complexity that's been created by the beavers. So, um, so it does all seem to be positive, as you would expect, really. This is a native animal. We're bringing it back into a into the wetland environment that it was uh, that it was first in, and it and it has helped to shape really. So it's a yeah, it's a, it seems to be a positive story for most species. Um, Richard, come on. I'd like to know: Do we know what the likelihood of inbreeding, etc., is for the future? As they're from a small founder population. Yeah, and it's one of the issues that we managed as part of the trial because at the very start we, it did look like we were starting with two animals and that's not an ideal place to start with a founder population so the license allowed us to bring an additional five animals into the population which is what we did during the trial period um, I mean there are rodent species and interbreeding is very part of their ecology and I think you'd expect that in the the way they move, they when they stay between uh, within a catchment and then move occasionally between catchments, would be the mechanism by which you'd have this sort of natural exchange of genetic material in a within a meta population. Um, so there's there are always always going to be a fair amount of inbreeding within a beaver population within a catchment, um, but you do need that occasional exchange of of genetic material between catchments. Um, and uh, and the beavers fortunately were Bavarian in origin, so we know that they were healthy stock, um, as opposed to some of the other species or some of the other groups of beavers that are coming from Norway, where the genetic base is a bit more limited. Um, so, yeah, we've been monitoring it carefully, but it is definitely a good question to, to keep an eye on.